12. Matthew chapter 12. Lord, thank you for providing your word for us. We thank you that it is perfect and without error. Help us to set aside our own opinions and instead have hearts to be taught from your word. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. I'm going to start this morning. We're going to look at some passages in the Gospels. And when you read through the Gospels, a phrase that you're going to see several times is is the phrase, this generation. And so there's some things we want to understand about this generation and what it means in the Gospels. So we'll start Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with, notice, this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with, notice, this generation, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Well, it's it's fairly clear from those verses that when the Lord is talking about this generation, he's talking about those, that group of individuals that was alive at that time that was there to hear his teaching. And he makes the point that the men of Nineveh would rise up in judgment with that generation because the men of Nineveh, they repented at the preaching of Jonas, but this generation was failing to repent at the preaching of someone greater than Jonas. A similar point is made with regard to the Queen of Sheba. Notice verse 45. Now this is about the the unclean spirit when it leaves a man and then it returns. Verse 45, Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Notice, Even so shall it be also unto this, and now he calls it a wicked generation. What's going on with this wicked generation is is it's obviously devil-possessed, and by and large, they have rejected the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now get Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse... Start in verse 34. Matthew 23, 34. Wherefore, behold... I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar." Now, it's talking there about Israel's persecution of the Old Testament prophets, and it it describes that upon you, and we'll talk about who the you is in a minute, may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel. That's obviously going all the way back to early Genesis. Then it says, under the blood of Zacharias. Notice verse 36. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So let's pause here and make sure we understand what's being said. The Lord is talking about the blood of the the righteous Abel, which is all the way back Genesis 4, unto Zacharias near the end of the Old Testament. And responsibility for that coming upon this generation Well, first of all, how is that fair? Why should this generation, whoever it is, why should they answer for all this stuff that took place over thousands of years? Is that, what's going on with that? Why is the Lord saying that? Does anyone know? Well, when he's saying that, 
he's saying that right here, right before the cross. Why is he saying that right there? What is about to unfold? Get Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 is one of the most helpful chapters to give you a comprehensive list of end times events and some of the things that are going to happen during the 70th week. So notice verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're looking for signs that will tell them when the end occurs. And there's going to be a whole bunch of things given to them in this passage. So, for example, uh, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he's telling them here some precursors that happen well before the end. You can read a whole bunch of things there. Go down to verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. When Matthew 24 references the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. What chapter in Daniel is it referring to? Nine. It's referring to Daniel 9. It's referring to Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27. And what, when you read Daniel 4, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, it's going to talk about the 70th week, and it is in the midst of the week, The week, by the way, is seven years. So we normally think of a week as seven days, but there's times in Scripture where a week is is seven years. In the midst of the 70th week, in other words, after three and a half years, the abomination of desolation is set up. That's what you see described in Matthew 24, 15. Now, notice verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So when the abomination of desolation is set up, Believers in Judea should flee to the mountains. Verse 17, Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, and so on. Verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's a helpful verse. What is commonly said is that the 70th week is the time of great tribulation. But if you read carefully what you were just told there, when it says, for then shall be great tribulation, what is the event that starts the great tribulation? It's verse 15, it's the abomination of desolation being set up. Well, given that, how long does the great tribulation last? Three and a half years, right? Because three and a half years of the 70th week pass before the abomination of desolation is set up, and then the great tribulation commences. Now keep going here. Go down to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, you see how Mark 24 gives you a whole bunch of time elements as to how things are sequenced. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The events that are described in Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30, refer to what event? The second coming. How do you know that's not the rapture? Well, one reason 
you know that it's not the rapture, is the rapture is said to be a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, right? The rapture had not yet been revealed at the time of Matthew 24. So Matthew 24, 29 and 30 is all about the second coming. Now skip down with me, if you would, to verse 34. Notice what this says. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now that tees up the issue that I want to talk about. When we saw the phrase, this generation, earlier in Matthew, who was the Lord speaking to when he said this generation? And, and he's talking specifically to the people that are right in front of him. Right? He's talking to the people that are alive and breathing at that moment in time. When he, when he says this generation, uh, the men of Nineveh will rise in judgment of this generation. He's talking about the men of Nineveh rising in judgment on unbelieving Israel during his, his earthly ministry. In other words, the people that were physically there present to witness his preaching and to reject it. So now what's interesting is this. Verse 34 says, this generation shall not pass. In other words, it won't die out till all these things be fulfilled. Now that creates a very interesting conundrum. Has that generation passed away at this point? They're not alive today, right? So if you were alive in A.D. 30, you are not alive today, clearly, right? Allie can't help you that much. Maybe she can extend your life for brief, you know, years maybe, but not that long, right? So what do you do with verse 34? Verse 34 is in red letters, so it's really important. That's not a true statement, is it? Because all the letters are the same. But nonetheless, verse 34 is spoken by the Lord himself. He specifically says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And yet that generation did pass and all those things were not fulfilled. Right? So, here is one way that people deal with that passage. What they will say is this. When you read Matthew 24, all of the events described in Matthew 24 were in fact fulfilled at that time in the first century. The problem with that, let's just take one example. Look at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now what I would say is that those events have not happened. And if you question that, you can walk outside and determine for yourself, right? What some will say is they will say, well, there was an eclipse that occurred during the first century, and that's how that was fulfilled. You follow me? In other words, there were some things that took place in the heavens, and that's what the fulfillment of Matthew 24, 29 was. The problem with that theory, how does verse 29 end? It ends with a colon. So verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't see how you can say verse 29 was fulfilled during the first century, but I really don't think you can say verse 30 was fulfilled during the first century. That means the second coming already happened. If you read Revelation 19 and 20, what happens at the second coming? Well, the Lord destroys his adversaries. How far does blood flow? 200 miles at the level of a horse's bridle. Well, did that happen in the first century? 
No. And then after the Lord does that, he sets up his kingdom for a thousand years. Did that already happen? No. So the idea that all of the events of Matthew 24 were fulfilled in the first century is not an, it's not an answer because it didn't happen. The second coming has not already occurred. So if that's not an explanation, then how do you deal with Matthew 24, 34 that says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled? <clears throat> I believe there is only one satisfactory answer to that question, and here's what it is. When the Lord makes the statement, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled, it is an accurate statement if one does not include the dispensation of grace. Did the Lord believe that the second coming was within 40 years of the time he spoke that? He did. So look with me at Acts chapter 2. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So notice that they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Then notice verse 14. But Peter standing up with the eleven. And let's just read it. Lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So what happened in Acts 2 is those that are assembled speak in tongues, and some witness that, and they say, well, they're drunk. Now, that accusation is really dumb, right? Look, look with me at... Uh, Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? What happens in Acts chapter 2, when the Galileans stand up, who are the Galileans in this passage, by the way? The twelve, the apostles, right? And they're all from Galilee. The twelve stand up, it's on the day of Pentecost, so there are Jews assembled in Jerusalem out of every nation under heaven, is what verse 5 tells you. So the Jews from every nation under heaven stand up, or they're present. They hear the Galileans speak in the language in which they were born. So is it a viable explanation that the Galileans were drunk? Have you ever been at a bar and what happens is someone gets drunk and they just start speaking French fluently. Have you ever seen that happen? Is that how it works? Wouldn't that be better? I took four years of Spanish and don't remember any of it. It, it. it would be so much simpler if all I needed to do was get drunk and then I could speak Spanish, right? It's a silly, silly accusation, isn't it? Now notice what Peter then says. For these are not drunk in verse 15, as ye suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He specifically says, what you are witnessing in Acts 2 is the fulfillment of what Joel wrote. Now notice verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That's what they were witnessing. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now notice verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great notable day of the Lord come. That's fascinating. So in Acts 2, 
in verses 19 and 20, when he talks about the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, it's the exact same thing we were looking at in Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. So in other words, notice this. When Matthew 24, 29 and 30 is spoken, when that occurs during the Olivet Discourse, just a little bit later in Acts 2, Peter, speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost, says that Joel is being fulfilled at that time, including the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, and so on. In other words, what he's saying is this. If you ignore this just for a moment, what he's really saying is, you're witnessing here Acts, in Acts 2, 17, you're witnessing the, the tongue talking, the, the pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh that Joel mentioned, and that's going to directly lead, directly lead to what Joel also mentioned, which is this right here. Meaning, before the cross, the Lord said, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled, including this. After the cross, Peter, speaking by the Holy Ghost, says, what you're seeing is the fulfillment of Joel, which leads to this. Both the Lord and Peter are saying, these things are going to be fulfilled within this generation's lifetime, a generation being 40 years. Look at Psalm 90, verse 10 for that if you want to. Or Psalm 95, verse 10. That still leaves us with the problem of those items were not, in fact, fulfilled. And the simple explanation of why they were not is that the dispensation of grace was an interruption of the prophetic calendar. Had there been no dispensation of grace the prophetic clock would have ticked forward and everything described in Joel 2 and Acts 2 and Matthew 24 would have occurred within the lifetime of what the Lord called this generation. However, what God did with the dispensation of grace, and let's just think about this for a moment. The dispensation of grace is a period of amnesty. In other words, if the dispensation of grace was not interposed, what would happen? Judgment, wrath. Sun turned to darkness, moon to blood, water would turn to blood, all, all the things described would occur. What God did as, as, as an act of grace was to put the prophetic program on hold insert the dispensation of grace and basically allow for the, 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 I'll call it the very simplified salvation of the earth. Now, what, what do I mean by that? If you think of before the dispensation of grace, how does the Bible describe the condition of Gentiles? Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Because they're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, they are therefore strangers from the covenants of promise. Because who had the covenants? Israel did. So they're strangers from the covenants of promise. And Ephesians 2, 11, 12 says they're without God and without hope. So they're in a very, very bad spot. So what God does is he says, you know what? Every word of prophecy has to be fulfilled. It will be, because he never lied and he never got anything wrong. But what he can do is he can choose to delay his judgment. And the dispensation of grace is a delaying of that judgment. It's a period of amnesty where people can be saved by grace through faith, both Jew and Gentile, without the works of the law, without circumcision, water baptism, and so on. Can anyone think of a couple examples in the Old Testament where a Gentile joins themselves to Israel? Ruth's a good one. Now just think about that for a minute. Did Ruth have to sort of go through a lot to do that? Well, let me ask you this. What do you have to do today today 
during the dispensation of grace to go from being lost to being saved? Do you have to move anywhere? Do you have to go through any sort of ceremony? No, you literally just believe, right? You can sit where you are and you can go from unbelief to being saved simply by having faith in the gospel. Is that the way it worked in time past? What did Rahab do, for example? When Rahab assists the Hebrew spies and she hangs the cord, where does she ultimately end up? She ends up joining herself to Israel, right? When, when Ruth cleaves unto Naomi, says, thy people shall be my people. They read that at weddings all the time. Is, is that what that verse is about? That's not what that verse is about. What that verse is about is Ruth, who is a Moabitess, who is a Gentile, says, you know what? I'm going to join myself to Israel. Was that a big life change for her? I mean, she's leaving her nation and joining a different one. So, so the dispensation of grace is a remarkable period of time where salvation is extremely simple and easy, right? You don't have to join anything. You don't have to move. All you have to do is have faith in the blood that Jesus Christ shed for you and you're eternally saved. So the dispensation of grace, I would suggest this to you, is the answer, it is the explanation as to the verses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that talk about all of these things shall come upon this generation. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, the reason they weren't fulfilled within the lifetime of those individuals is that the prophetic calendar itself was put on hold. Okay? So now let me ask you a follow-up question. If that is true, if it is true that the dispensation of grace put the prophetic calendar on hold, what does that tell you about the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy during the dispensation of grace? See, what is commonly said, and, and, and maybe you've seen this, what do people commonly say 1948 is? People commonly say 1948 is the fulfillment of Ezekiel, where it's the gathering of Israel into the land. What people typically do that want to date the rapture is they will go through the Old Testament and they will find either various feasts or other events and then they will somehow combine those with something that's happening today and then they will set a date for the rapture. Does that make any sense whatsoever? I mean, let me just land this point. The reason why none of that makes any sense, the reason why 1948 can't be a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy is the very nature of the dispensation of grace is that it is an interruption of Old Testament prophecy. If Old Testament prophecy had not been interrupted, the second coming would have happened in the first century. So 1948 was not the fulfillment of prophecy. When people write books and they predict the date of the rapture, or they have videos and they predict the date of the rapture based upon feasts in the Old Testament, it is a fundamental misunderstanding that we are living during a time out in the prophetic program. So here's a real simple one. Maybe some of you will get this. How much time passes on the game clock during a timeout? None. That's the purpose of a timeout, right? Why does a team call timeout? Because they want the clock to stop. During the timeout, there is no passage of game time, right? I mean, that's simple and straightforward. That is fundamentally what the dispensation of grace is. 
It is an interruption. It is a cessation of the prophetic clock. Now, will the prophetic clock resume? Yes, it will. Tell me, what causes the dispensation of grace to end? So let me, let me ask it this way. What is the last event of the dispensation of grace? So the catching up, right? The rapture, the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's the last event. But what causes the dispensation of grace to end? Does God just say, you know, I'm tired of this. This is... Look with me at Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery... As you recall, a mystery is hidden wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 defines it that way. So we're looking here at some wisdom, but it's hidden. That ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Now let me pause there. Guess what happens to people that are ignorant of the mysteries? What does Scripture say about them? They're sincere, well-meaning people. Is that what it says? They're wise in their own conceits. They're egotistical, is what it's saying, right? It's better to be wise in the Word of God than wise in your own conceits. When you're wise in your own conceits, there's just no value to it. Now notice this, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. So was 100% of Israel blinded? It was simply a blinding in part. Notice the next word. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Israel was blinded. Were they blinded forever? Nope. They were only blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Once the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, they'll no longer be blinded. Now here's what I want you to notice about verse 25. It talks about the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That is a description of what causes the dispensation of grace to end. Look at verse 22. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward the goodness of if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. A lot of dispensationalists are very troubled by verse 22 because they read verse 22 to suggest that God has severity toward the body of Christ, but toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. So what they reason is, if the body of Christ doesn't continue in his goodness, it will face severity. But that passage is not about the body of Christ. Who is it about? Gentiles, and how do you know that? So look at verse 13. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, One of the clues as to who a passage is about is it tells you, right? Here's what's happening in Romans 11. When Paul says, for I speak to you Gentiles, he's not speaking to the body of Christ. He's speaking to Gentiles. And the reason why he is doing that is that itself is a dispensational change Because guess who the Old Testament is focused on? Israel. But what happens during the dispensation of grace, you can read this in Romans 11, Gentiles are grafted in to the olive tree. As they are grafted into the olive tree, they now have direct access 
to God that they did not have in time past. That's why Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 describe them as without God. Some, a Gentile in time past, if they wanted to have a right relationship with God, what would they do? Join themselves to Israel, right? You, you recall this, but it's just fascinating. How does David describe Goliath when he's going out to fight with him? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that, that he should defy the armies of the living God. Was David making fun of his hygiene? What was David doing? What, what David was doing is he keenly understood Israel was God's chosen people, Gentiles were not, and so this giant, however big he may be, is on the wrong team. He's completely separate from God's blessing. In time past, for a Gentile to come into blessing with God, come into right relationship with God, he did that through the nation of Israel. That's why they would become circumcised and join themselves to Israel. With that as context, what does Paul need to do during the dispensation of grace? Well, he's going to write directly to Gentiles to explain what's happening because something is happening here that's different. Here, in time past, there's a middle wall of partition during the dispensation of grace, what happened? God concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. So what Romans 11 does is this. Paul says, for I speak to you Gentiles. And he is telling Gentiles, here is the wonderful offer that is available to you. In time past you were without hope. Today you have direct access, and God will have an, an attitude toward thee of goodness if thou continue in his goodness. What happens when Gentiles as a group say, we don't need the gospel, we're all good. I'm fine, I'm a good person, I don't need Christ's death. Well, what happens at the end of the dispensation of grace, because God respects free will, is when the Gentiles as a group reject the offer of salvation, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You follow me? In other words, if, if, every, if, if Gentiles as a group say, we're really not interested, that means no one else wants to enter in and thus the fullness of Gentiles has come in, is there any reason to continue the dispensation of grace at that point in time? There's not. And so God looks at, at, at Gentiles and says, sadly, right, I'm sorry you feel that way. I will honor your choice. And since you have no interest in having a relationship with me, this direct access I've given you, you don't need it. You're telling me you're not interested. So I'm just going to take it away and we'll go back to where we were. The prophetic clock will resume. Now, by the way, just, just so we're clear on this, if you're a Gentile in unbelief before the rapture and the rapture happens, are you in a worse predicament? You went from having direct access to God by faith in the gospel. You don't need to move anywhere, do anything. You just need to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins. To your back, to the same economy as time passed, you're without God and without hope in the world. It, it is a, 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 a tragic, it is an absolutely enormous mistake not to get saved during the dispensation of grace, miss the rapture, and then be under the, the kingdom program at that point in time. And by the way, are these happy times? So right now, we are annoyed with the direction of the world, most of us, right? And it's not great. But it's nothing like this.
So we, we, we continue to live during the time of amnesty, during the time where people can come to faith in the gospel easily and have eternal life and have eternal security. By the way, isn't eternal security a nice thing? When you get saved during the dispensation of grace, is there any way for you to lose your salvation? Does Matthew 24, 13 tell you that you need to tell the people that are under that economy they need to endure unto the end? I'll take this. Right? You, you can't mess it up. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. All right, turn with me to... Turn with me to Romans. You're in Romans 11. We'll do Romans 11, 6 in just a minute. I'm going to get ready to wrap up here. We understand that the gospel is Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is not what we do. It is what Christ did for us. And we understand that for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So you're saved by grace through faith. It has nothing to do with your works. The reason I want to focus on Romans 11, 6 is this. Let's look at it. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What is that saying? Here's what it is saying. When you talk to people about the gospel, most people, or at least many, have in their minds a confused understanding of how salvation works. And many think Christ died for our sins, but you got to live it. Christ died for our sins, but if you do that, you'll lose it. In other words, Christ did most of what was required, but you have to live it, or you have to avoid this sin that would cause you to lose it, or you have to do something nebulous in addition to God's grace. The whole point of Romans eleven six 6 is to say the opposite of that. And if by grace, which we know it is, and if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. If you take pure grace and you add any requirement of works to it, what does it cease to be? It's no longer grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. See, you have really two choices. You can be saved 100% by grace, apart from works, or you can be saved 100% by works without grace. How's this one going to do? Your righteousness is as filthy rags. What Romans 11.6 does is it gives you this option, 100% grace, this option, 100% works, but what it rules out is everything in between. Because if you take grace and you add one work to it, it ceases to be grace. Which means this, we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. And if you change any of the alones, you're teaching a false gospel. Because it's 100% grace, it's solely by faith, and it's only in Christ. Amen? So hopefully you have clarity on that, because that confusion about that so I'll say this, you can decide for yourself. I am very fearful of the gospel. I'm very fearful of a gospel message that adds any works to it. For example, you have, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be water baptized and stop sinning and quit this sin, whatever it is. And the reason why I'm fearful of that is if you think very carefully about Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It, notice what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Then this last part. Lest any man should boast. God will save you in your wretched state. He will require no works of you. But the one thing he will not do is he will not save you 
in your self-righteousness of believing you can add to what Christ did. Did you realize how insulting that is? When people say Christ did it, but, I mean, stop. Don't say, do you realize how insulting it is to say that? Christ leaves heaven, takes upon himself human flesh, suffers, sheds the blood of God to pay for our sins, pays the full price, and then people act like they have to add something to it? Do you realize what, how, how insulting that is to God's grace? It, how much that devalues Christ's sacrifice? That's why I think it's so important to preach the gospel clearly, because I, I fear that based upon Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and Romans eleven six, 6, that if you add even one work to the gospel, you're making grace of none effect. And God's not going to save you in your self-righteousness. Because he, if, there's, if there's, it's clear there's one thing he hates, he hates man's pride. If, if, if God did, listen, if the way the gospel worked is there were all kinds of things man could boast in, there'd be a lot more people saved. You know why? People like to boast. And if he created a way where you could boast about it, <laughs> a lot of people would believe it. But, but that's an insult to what Christ did. And so the way that salvation works, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Okay, hope you have clarity on that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the dispensation of grace. We thank you for everything you've given to us worthless sinners. We thank you that we can have eternal life as a free gift. We thank you that you've made it so that we can't mess it up during the dispensation of grace. We rejoice in, in all that you've given us, and we pray that we would walk in a way that would be pleasing to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.